I just like the firepower. I'm a little kid at heart. I like, I like working on the gun. I like loading all the munitions we load. Uh, when we go TDY anywhere, like to Davis Month or anything like that, we load everything we can get our hands on. And it's, it's entertaining. It's hard work, it keeps me busy, but it's fun. Always a welcome sight to U.S. and Allied forces on the ground. This is the A-10 Thunderbolt II, better known to its legions of fans as the Warthog. While it can be equipped with a wide variety of today's most sophisticated weaponry, the Warthog is, and always will be known for one rather distinct feature. This is the gun. Officially known as the GAU-8 Avenger, the gun is the primary weapon system upon which the entire airframe of the A-10 was built. It is essentially a flying cannon providing 30 millimeters worth of American air power. So this is uh, obviously the business end of the 30 millimeter. Uh, here are the rounds right here, so this is the, uh, the, the casing uh, for the round. And these are actually, they stay within the gun because uh, if you were to spit these out, like a lot of times other guns will, uh, so much ballast and the center of gravity of the aircraft will come off so much that you have to keep it in. Um, a normal combat burst is what we call it, is a two second uh, squeeze. So with the gun spinning out, that's around 112 rounds for uh, two seconds. With the amount of rounds that we have, which is 1,100, I guess about nine trigger pulls of useful, uh, I guess, combat damage that we can provide. The gun is uh, by far uh, the Hogpod's favorite uh, thing to do. Um, the gun is the most flexible weapon we have, most of the time the most effective, but then we also at the same time too can carry a uh, pretty incredible assortment of different weapons uh, between the Maverick missiles, precision guided uh, munitions, rockets, uh, illumination, stuff we can use at night and all different sorts of uh, stuff they're constantly building upon on the hog, but um, the gun is still the most uh, effective, flexible weapon we have. One of the distinctive abilities of the gun is the significant amount of firepower it can put into a target in very short order. The GAU-8 is a complex piece of heavy metal consisting of seven rotating barrels, each seven and a half feet long and weighing 70 pounds apiece. With the total gun assembly, including the feed system and loaded ammo drum, weighing over 4,000 pounds. Airmen working in the aircraft armament systems field are responsible for keeping the weapon system inspected, maintained, and capable of spitting out up to 70 rounds per second. The GAU-8 system holds 1,150 rounds. It fires approximately 3,900 rounds a minute. The first second of fire fires approximately 50 rounds a second, and then from there it accelerates up to 70 rounds a second. One of the best aspects of working on this is hearing back from ground troops where they called it in and uh, the weapon system performed as designed. It's just, it's great to be a part of that. This is the ammunition loading adapter that we use on the 30 millimeter gun on the A-10 Thunderbolt II. Uh, it's commonly referred to as the ALA or the Dragon. The ALA is powered by the aircraft's hydraulic power through a flex drive. It attaches to the aircraft with the load head and we have a CIU that attaches to the ammo can that's delivered by ammo. We normally load uh, 575 rounds per can, which adds up to 1150 for the aircraft. And what it does at the same time, we can upload bullets and download bullets. And this times directly to the gun system. One of the training advantages available to A-10s and other aircraft in the Great Lakes region is the proximity of the Grayling Air Gunnery Range in Northern Michigan. A-10 pilots from the 107th Fighter Squadron at Selfridge Air National Guard Base are just a 30 minute flight to the range at Grayling where pilots face realistic and dynamic training scenarios. There, pilots are able to train with joint terminal attack controllers, placing bombs and bullets right on target. It's an awesome target set. Uh, that we can go up there and play on. They're constantly changing it around as to what their uh, customers' needs are. It prepares you uh, very well because you can go up there, practice it, you know, kind of training around it, and really when you start to uh, fly over in Afghanistan and start to do the stuff that you're practicing training for up there, you're like, oh yeah, I remember doing this up at, uh, up at Grayling a lot of times. For Warthog pilots, maintainers, and their fellow airmen, ensuring this firepower is available when and where needed is at the core of their duty to their state and nation. The uh, thing I like the most, obviously, is uh, serving the United States uh, military, serving in that capacity, and uh, helping protect the people. 
uh, in America overseas and uh, being a part of that. Our biggest thing that we do uh, as uh, hog pilots, helping out the troops on the ground and uh, you know, providing that aero coverage that they could need at any time. I just like the firepower. I'm a little kid at heart. I like, I like working on the gun. I like loading all the munitions we load. Uh, when we go TDY anywhere, like to Davis Month or anything like that, we load everything we can get our hands on. And it's, it's entertaining. It's hard work, it keeps me busy, but it's fun. Always a welcome sight to U.S. and Allied forces on the ground. This is the A-10 Thunderbolt II, better known to its legions of fans as the Warthog. While it can be equipped with a wide variety of today's most sophisticated weaponry, the Warthog is, and always will be known for one rather distinct feature. This is the gun. Officially known as the GAU-8 Avenger, the gun is the primary weapon system upon which the entire airframe of the A-10 was built. It is essentially a flying cannon providing 30 millimeters worth of American air power. So this is uh, obviously the business end of the 30 millimeter. Uh, here are the rounds right here. So this is the uh, the, the casing uh, for the round, and these are actually they stay within the gun because uh, if you were to spit these out, like a lot of times other guns will, uh, so much ballast and the center of gravity of the aircraft will come off so much that you have to keep it in. Um, a normal combat burst is what we call it. It's a two second uh, squeeze. So with the gun spinning out, this around. 112 rounds for uh, two seconds. With the amount of rounds that we have, which is 1,100, uh, I guess about nine trigger pulls uh, of useful, uh, I guess, combat damage that we can provide. The gun is uh, by far uh, the hog pod's favorite uh, thing to do. Um, the gun is the most flexible weapon we have, most of the time the most effective, but then we also at the same time too can carry a uh, pretty incredible assortment of different weapons uh, between the Maverick missiles, precision guided uh, munitions, rockets, uh, illumination stuff we can use at night and all different sorts of uh, stuff they're constantly building upon on the hog but um, the gun is still the most uh, effective flexible weapon we have. One of the distinctive abilities of the gun is the significant amount of firepower it can put into a target in very short order. The GAU-8 is a complex piece of heavy metal consisting of seven rotating barrels each seven and a half feet long and weighing 70 pounds apiece with the total gun assembly, including the feed system and loaded ammo drum, weighing over 4,000 pounds. Airmen working in the aircraft armament systems field are responsible for keeping the weapon system inspected, maintained, and capable of spitting out up to 70 rounds per second. The GAU-8 system holds 1,150 rounds. It fires approximately 3,900 rounds a minute. The first second of fire fires approximately 50 rounds a second, and then from there it accelerates up to 70 rounds a second. One of the best aspects of working on this is hearing back from ground troops, where they called it in, and uh, the weapon system performed as designed. It's just, it's great to be a part of that. This is the ammunition loading adapter that we use on the 30 millimeter gun on the A-10 Thunderbolt II. Uh, it's commonly referred to as the ALA or the Dragon. The ALA is powered by the aircraft's hydraulic power through a flex drive. It attaches to the aircraft with the load head and we have a CIU that attaches to the ammo can that's delivered by ammo. We normally load uh, 575 rounds per can, which adds up to 1150 for the aircraft. And what it does at the same time, we can upload bullets and download bullets. And this times directly to the gun system. One of the training advantages available to A-10s and other aircraft in the Great Lakes region is the proximity of the Grayling Air Gunnery Range in northern Michigan. A-10 pilots from the 107th Fighter Squadron at Selfridge Air National Guard Base are just a 30-minute flight to the range at Grayling, where pilots face realistic and dynamic training scenarios. There, pilots are able to train with joint terminal attack controllers, placing bombs and bullets right on target. It's an awesome target set uh, that we can go up there and play on. They're constantly changing it around 
as to what their uh, customers' needs are. It prepares you uh, very well because you can go up there, practice it, you know, kind of training around it, and really when you start to uh, fly over in Afghanistan and start to do the stuff that you're practicing training for up there, you're like, oh yeah, I remember doing this up at, uh, up at Grayling a lot of times. For Warthog pilots, maintainers, and their fellow airmen, ensuring this firepower is available when and where needed is at the core of their duty to their state and nation. The thing I like the most, obviously, is uh, serving the United States uh, military, serving in that capacity, and uh, helping protect the people uh, in America overseas and uh, being a part of that. Our biggest thing that we do uh, as uh, hog pilots, helping out the troops on the ground and uh, you know, providing that aero coverage that they could need at any time. I'm uh, Dr. Thomas McKenna. I'm a program officer at the Office of Naval Research. So there's substantial losses incurred when you have a major fire, when you can't suppress it at an early stage. SAFER is the uh, shipboard autonomous firefighting robot. And this is a program uh, that's been going on for about five years, basically to develop a humanoid capable of fire suppression. My name is John Farley. I work at the Naval Research Laboratory, and I'm the director of the Shadwell, which is the Navy's fire test ship. If we have a shipboard fire, we have to be able to quickly get it under control and then regain the ship's ability to maintain its fighting mission. You know, we have not only the ship, but we have ordnance on board, and we have a lot of flammable systems on board. Sometimes it's hard to keep the sailors up to the latest as far as training is concerned. Or sometimes they could create an environment and make it worse. Now the robot could be uh, trained and constantly updated to make sure that the conditions are not as bad as what a human could make it. Well, our objectives for the demo on the Shadwell were to show that the, the robot could walk over what was a very uneven floor, that it could uh, orient itself to the fire, that it could autonomously handle the hose, operate the hose, aim the hose, and suppress the fire, which it succeeded in. I'm Brian Latimer. I'm an associate professor at Virginia Tech in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Now, I think robots are well suited to be sent into those environments, and bipedal humanoid robots are particularly good for those applications because even in the tight, confined conditions that you might have inside of structures, these types of robots can uh, be designed to maneuver in those uh, conditions. Uh, SAFER is an electromechanical robot, so it's driven by batteries and all the motors are electrical. So we put a rain gear type suit on the robot just to protect it from those types of uh, basic uh, steam, particulate, and water drop hazards. So we have uh, visible cameras on board the robot. We have something called a LIDAR, which is a rotating laser that gives the location of the points in the field of the view of the robot. And then lastly, we have uh, stereoscopic uh, thermal imaging cameras that the robot uses to uh, detect and locate the position of a fire so they can suppress it. We combine the notion of uh, smart sensors in the spaces, micro flyers that can uh, fly even in smoke, go through those extremely narrow doors that it could locate uh, fires and operate in those hallways even in dense fire smoke and it succeeded all those tasks. So today was the first time we came on board uh, an actual Navy ship. We were able to do a lot of things uh, today that, that we hadn't done previously and we have a lot of hope for new advancements in the future. We have some fundamental issues in robotic mobility that we still have to address as well as uh, working out the human system uh, integration issues and we'll continue to advance the capability with better and better demonstrations. 
at the current time, the robot is teleoperated. So you have operators uh, standing off with the computer console. Where we're, we intend to go is to have a combination of natural language and gesture control. I think the robot has gone through amazing transition within four years. And I think it's a worthy investment for a long-term project. But it's going to take a lot of time, a lot of dedication. And we're working towards uh, human-robot teams, what we call the hybrid force. Humans and robots working together. This week on a special edition of today's Air Force, we'll take an in-depth look at the Boneyard. Without the parts that we reclaim here at the Boneyard, we'd stop flying. We'll meet the dedicated team that brings new life to old aircraft and hear the nostalgic stories of airmen who flew these planes decades ago. We'll have all those stories and much more right now on today's Air Force. Welcome to a special edition of today's Air Force. I'm your host, Staff Sergeant Shannon Ofiara. On this special edition of the show, we're taking you to Tucson, Arizona for an inside look at what happens to Air Force planes after they've flown their last mission. Recycling is not a new concept for the Air Force. In fact, we've been doing it throughout our history. And getting new life out of old aircraft is the main purpose of the Aerospace Maintenance and Regeneration Group at Davis-Monthan Air Force Base. Seen from the air, this sprawling 2,600-acre facility is filled with rows of neatly arranged aircraft, many which look almost ready for takeoff. But on the ground, it's a different story. With all sorts of planes in various stages of disassembly, many of them several decades old, it's easy to see how this place got the nickname that most people know it as, the Boneyard. Tech Sergeant Nicholas Kurtz explains how the program got its start. There are more than 4,000 aircraft parked here at the Boneyard. Taken together, these planes would make up the second largest air force in the entire world. But most of these planes will never fly again. They're here to serve a different purpose. The Boneyard is where the Air Force and every other U.S. government agency sends their decommissioned airplanes to be taken apart, reused in other aircraft, or turned over to the Defense Reutilization and Marketing Office to be sold as scrap. The reclamation process at AMARG is able to extract the very last tax dollars from these aircraft after they've reached the end of their useful operational lives. It's a mission that's been helping save taxpayers money since the end of World War II. Shortly after the Second World War, um, there were huge quantities of surplus aircraft scattered all over the world. A lot of them were scrapped where they were in theater, depending on the types. Other airframes were identified as having value for potential future use, or there just wasn't enough capacity in the overseas theaters to, to dispose of them uh, as required. So a lot of them were, were ferried back here. Uh, in particular at Arizona, uh, a lot of B-17s, B-24s, and B-25s were all located here. And the 50s was kind of a, a unique golden age of jet flight and propeller flight. There was an enormous diversity of aircraft being used by, by the Air Force, uh, some more successfully than others. So uh, a lot of them were rapidly outclassed and made obsolete. So, you know, entire production runs of aircraft were brought here for reclamation, like F-84s, uh, B-36s, whereas others were brought here for storage and regeneration. A lot of B-29s were stored here after World War II, and they were pressed back into service for Korea. So up until the early 60s, AMARC was principally an Air Force facility. Uh, the Navy and the Marine Corps maintained their own facility up outside Phoenix at Litchfield Park. Uh, but that was closed up, I think, in 1962, and all those assets transferred down here. So since that time, this has been the complete 
storage facility for government aircraft. So you find NASA aircraft over there, you find Coast Guard aircraft, Border Patrol, Navy, Marine, Reserve units, training units. We have a lot of unique airframes here, a lot of uh, one-of-a-kinds or few-of-a-kinds. Behind us here, there's a B-36 Peacemaker. It's special. It um, is the last production one ever built by, by Convair. Uh, came off the assembly line in 1958, flew for two years, retired out in, in Fort Worth. It's one of only four existing airframes out of nearly 400 built. And one of my personal favorites is the Boeing B-52A um, Strato Fortress. It's the oldest buff in existence, a serial number three. Uh, third one off the production line. Uh, it was the principal uh, test airframe um, and carrier mothership for the X-15 program. So nearly all of the early Gemini, Mercury, and Apollo astronauts all dropped off of our uh, off of our B-52A uh, in the X-15 program. Uh, the recently deceased uh, Neil Armstrong was a participant of that program and dropped off our airplane. So it's to my eyes, it's kind of reeking in history. I, I, I really love it. <laughs> As the Air Force has evolved, so has the Boneyard. During the Cold War, America's determination to outpace the Soviet Union in the space race helped fuel an explosion of technological advancement. Almost as quickly as they were introduced, U.S. military aircraft were regularly phased out as newer aircraft flew faster, higher, and farther. The outmoded airplanes were sent here, and the Boneyard's inventory began to swell. With the Vietnam War came a renewed call for even more advanced bombers and fighters. By the time that war started to wind down in 1973, the Boneyard's fleet had reached an all-time high of more than 6,000 aircraft. Today, some 4,000 aircraft still sit in the Boneyard, in various stages of the reclamation process. But the inventory here, much like in today's Air Force, is destined to change. You know, as our Air Force becomes more and more technologically reliant, um, fewer and fewer different types of airframes are being produced. Um, I would expect probably in 20 or 25 years, you'd probably see less than a thousand aircraft over there. And looking out 40 years, there may not be a need for such a large facility. There will always be a need for the facility, but whether or not you're going to find fleets of KC-135s or fields of F-15s, Probably not. You know, there's 200 some odd F-22s. You know, the F-35 hasn't even really come into full operational service yet, so I wouldn't expect to see any of them even twinkling at retirement for 35 or 40 years. You know, but there are probably several hundred of them. So it's, it's not going to be the same vast, diverse fleet that you see now. So, you know, it is kind of the end of a golden age, you know. Over the course of its more than 60-year history here in the American Southwest, AMARG has become something of an aviation enthusiast's mecca. Wherever you go in the world, anybody who kind of is interested in aviation or airplanes at all, if you mention Tucson, you know, their eyes will go, oh, that's where the boneyards are, right? I, yeah, yeah, that's where the boneyards are. And the boneyards are here for a very good reason. Turns out the desert climate here in Tucson provides an ideal environment for long-term storage of these aircraft with very little risk of corrosion or other damage from the elements. The ground we're on here uh, is, is fairly unique. It's, it's a very high calcium soil, very stable. When it's dry as it is now, it's as hard as concrete and very, very, very robust. And with the dry weather conditions here, low relative humidity year round, very low rainfall, averaging about six to eight inches a year in the region, there's nothing like uh, tornadoes or hurricanes or that type of thing here to potentially destroy assets. So Tucson was identified as an ideal location for an active reclamation facility. And that year-round sunshine also makes this an ideal location for people to come visit and experience Air Force history in person. Normally, when someone wants to get a good look at some military aircraft, they have to do it through binoculars. But here at the Boneyard, you can get up close and personal with everything from fighters, bombers, tankers, lifters, just about everything the Air Force has flown in the last half century. Our visitors almost universally enjoy the sense of adventure they feel coming out here in the desert to look at airplanes. Uh, we don't rope off our airplanes outside. People are free to get up and stick their head in the wheel well, bump their heads on a propeller, trip over a tie-down cable, run from rattlesnakes. You know, it's, 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 it's the authentic desert experience out here. And it's a big part of our charm and our appeal. One of our sort of taglines is, you know, where you can touch history and we, you know, we, we embrace that. So it's not all just about tearing down old aircraft as newer technology makes them obsolete. 
preserving Air Force history has become like a secondary mission at the Boneyard. Along with the Pima Air and Space Museum right across the street, AMARG serves as a sort of monument to the accomplishments and innovations of the past, hoping to inspire America's future pilots, aircraft engineers, and astronauts. You know, our next generation of aerospace innovators, for all you know, could be wandering around here this weekend getting that whiff of hydraulic fluid. If we can expose and encourage young people to come out and, and challenge themselves and, and find a direction through what we do here, however little, I think it's important work. Time and technology march on. The Boneyard will continue in its mission, taking custody of outdated aircraft, salvaging and reusing every part possible. But except for the small handful of aircraft that are preserved for posterity, once a certain model of jet fighter or helicopter or long-range bomber is gone, it's gone forever. A common misconception that a lot of people have with AMARC um, is that there's still World War II aircraft over there. <laughs> you know, we, uh, more often than you think, we, you know, we do get emails or phone calls from people doing family history or have heard legend through one of their uncles or cousins that, oh yeah, there's a boneyard out in Arizona that's got all these World War II aircraft out there. So they call wondering if their grandfather's B-24 is still parked across the street there and we have to generally explain to them no I'm afraid not I mean it was turned into beer cans probably 60 years ago so the idea that a lot of people have is that the boneyard is really a boneyard like a graveyard where it's like it's a very static kind of place where nothing happens it's just a big you know I don't know like some hillbilly farm in the middle of Texas with 400 old tractors laying there it's anything but as you may have seen it's a very heavily engaged dynamic um, busy, busy organization that's tasked with supporting, you know, the mission of the United States Air Force and its allies. And that's a huge amount of work. For today's Air Force from Tucson, Arizona, I'm Tech Sergeant Nicholas Kurtz.